didn't have a special structure on our chromosomes, we would. Okay? When we look at eukaryotic chromosomes, we discover that at their far ends, they have an odd set of nucleotides. They have thousands and thousands of repeats of a sequence that varies between five and, seven, five and eight base, bases in an organism. I think in humans it's about seven bases long. Okay? Repeated thousands and thousands of times. That structure is called a telomere. T-E-L-O-M-E-R-E. -E -E, telomere. So a telomere is a, is, a, is, a, is a sequence that's found at the end of linear eukaryotic chromosomes and it has thousands and thousands of copies of the same five to eight base sequence. Now, when people first discovered the telomeres, they were very puzzled by them. Why is the sequence there? Until they started realizing how DNA polymerase, with its limitations, was going to shorten the sequence with every time the cell replicated. Okay? The longer the sequence of telomeres that we have, the more protected we are against that shortening with every round of replication. Because the important genes are inside. They're not in the telomeres. The telomeres are, we can think of as a sort of a protective region around the genes that are on the inside that are important. I like to think of it as a fuse. Okay. You light a fuse, and a fuse goes, and when the fuse finally gets to the hot stuff, a bomb goes off, right? It blows up. That's what happens when you run out of telomeres. Because you start chewing up important gene sequences, and the cell dies. Now, there are people who think, for example, that the longer that your telomeres are, the longer your lifespan is. And there's some interesting evidence that, in fact, that's true. Well, how do you get your telomeres, right? You get your telomeres while you're a fertilized egg up until the time that you're about born. During that time, you have this enzyme called telomerase that's active. What does telomerase do? Well, it uses a very interesting trick to build the telomere. That's what this figure is trying to show you. It doesn't do a very good job of showing you, but Suffice it to say, it attaches okay, to a three prime end that's hanging off and using a primer that it carries on it, it carries a little five to eight base pair RNA with it that it uses, uh, I'm sorry, not as a primer, it carries a template with it that it copies over and over and over and over. The primer is actually the three prime end of the chromosome. Yes, sir? Yep. Eight yep. Probably not. Probably not a factor. Probably not a factor. Good question. Good question. Yes. Aren't there some studies that link uh, stress to the shortening of telomeres? You are, in fact, correct. There is. Okay. There are a variety of physiological effects that are linked to shortening of telomeres, and the full story by which the telomeres shorten is not completely understood. I'll be honest with you. Although we know the model here, the model is very simple. Okay. Yes, sir. Matt. Um, does the DNA prioritize the genes by placing less important ones on the outside? Does the, do, do, are the genes organized so that the less important ones are on the outside? I don't know the answer to that question. You would predict that that probably would be the case and that you would, in fact, start seeing effects. But every gene that you have is there for a reason. So um, in a sense, it's hard to pri I mean, you can imagine some are more important than others, but nonetheless, that every gene is ultimately important. So yeah, yeah, but... But again, I, I don't know the specific answer to the question. Yes, Lynette. Okay, so, and I, and I said that poorly, I apologize. So, telomerase carries its own template. It carries a little sequence of RNA that's five to eight base pairs long. So what it does is it comes up here and it latches itself onto the three prime end and it lays that primer out there so that the polymerase can copy it. It's a very interesting and odd enzyme. So this polymerase is copying an RNA template and using the three prime end of the chromosome as a primer. Okay? So this makes telomerase a reverse transcriptase. 
something that copies RNA and makes DNA is a reverse transcriptase. Well, so the telomerase, what it does then, and I didn't finish the story, so let me finish the story then. What the telomerase does is it starts making thousands and thousands of copies out this direction, and now it's possible for an RNA polymerase to come out, say, here, and say, okay, I'll make a primer so that now DNA can be filled in. And so that's what happens ultimately. So that's how you build your telomeres over and over and over using this telomerase that's there. One of the questions that students frequently ask at this point is, well, if we can figure out how to make telomerase active, then we can live forever. Everybody's in favor of that, right? You're voting for it back there? A vote, another vote from the crowd. I'm very happy to see these votes. Okay. Well, that's fine except for the fact that we discover that there's only a handful of cells in which telomerase is active. Embryonic cells, stem cells, and, oh yes, cancer cells. Now, one of the things that you might do by making telomerase active is turn yourself into an enormous tumor. I don't know that's the case. Okay? But I would wager that you would be running a risk of that. Well, why do tumors have telomerase active? The answer is because they have to. If they don't have telomerase active, they die out. So when you see a tumor, it has already selected itself for having telomerase active. It's not a very satisfying answer, but that is the answer. Okay? So activating the expression of a gene is a complicated thing, but tumor cells have selected or have self-selected such that they have telomerase active. That's why we refer to tumor cells as immortal. We can take a tumor out of a person and we can literally grow it on a petri dish forever if we keep feeding it properly. We can't do that with our regular cells. They'll go for a few generations and they will die, and the reason they die is they start running out of telomeres. Yes? There are cancer cells that have been growing since about 1940. Yes. There was a lecture on campus uh, about a week ago um, talking about the, um, uh, a, a woman named Helen, um, Hen Henrietta Lacks, that's what I'm sorry, I used to say Helen, Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks was the first person whose cells they took and kept growing and they're still growing today. So yes, they've done that. How many people went and saw that lecture? Did you enjoy that? Yeah. She's, uh, she, I actually saw her in the Colbert Report. Uh, uh, she was uh, about a couple months ago when her book first came out, and she had she actually bantered with Stephen uh, quite well. It was, it was a very interesting uh, interesting story. But uh, Henrietta Lacks was the woman whose uh, cells were taken. Her, her cells are called HeLa cells, and they're used in virtually every um, laboratory that does any kind of, of human uh, tissue culture work. Almost every laboratory has these cells. Yes, sir. Yeah. And it's necessary for cancer cells. Is there a way can we possibly it could be deactivated thereby nothing in adult cells uses it? So his question is can we inactivate it and if inactivate telomerase and therefore use this as an anti cancer treatment? That's basically your question. And the answer is there's some promising therapies in action doing just that. So we're thinking about it the wrong way. We're thinking about it in terms of let's make it active so that we live forever, when in fact we should be saying maybe we can use this information to kill cancer cells because we have a magic bullet as long as we don't disturb our stem cells. Right? Because if we, if we kill our stem cells, we are going to live a couple, generation, a couple generations of cell time and then we're going to be a few generations and we're going to be gone. So they have to, the, the, the therapies have to be applied appropriately. But yes, there is some very interesting work that's being done with um, anti-telomerase drugs right now. Can stem cells also live forever? Um, it, it appears that stem cells can be propagated much like uh, tumor cells can. But they're, the problem with stem cells is they're very, very difficult to, to culture. So um, it's, not a, it's not as trivial as working with a, with a tumor cell. Yes?
Yeah, um, so the question over here was they have longer term, do they go longer? It's, it's not a, a, a fixed thing, so a, a premature baby, I would say probably the answer is no. There, there are some, some interesting work that people have done that are related to the questions that both of you asked about that. One is if you have um, children when you are an old man, you know, you're 90 years old and you have uh, uh, children, do your children live for a shorter period of time? Because you're starting out with a shorter DNA um, compared to um, you know, somebody who's 30 years old. And the initial work on that suggested there might be a relationship, but it's not a very strong one if there is one. So that went out the window. Another thing that people saw was, people thought about was, well, if we look at how we clone animals, okay, we take a, an, uh, take a, a nucleus out of a, a, an adult animal and we put it into a fertilized egg, do, this, does this animal then how, now have the, um, the telomeres of an adult and it lives a shorter period of, of time? And the answer to that one is a little bit more confusing. In some organisms, it appears that that's exactly what happens. They die prematurely. Dolly the sheep, the first sheep that was cloned, died of old age at a very premature, at a very early age. Okay? Subsequent studies have shown that in some organisms, they live just as long, suggesting that telomerase is becoming active and it's elongating the telomeres and not affecting the overall process. So that, that picture is not completely clear either. Um, and as I said, we don't fully understand the shortening process. Okay, because stem cells play a role in here that we don't fully understand. Yes, Stuart. And is this present in all care um, It's present in all eukaryotic organisms. Um, there are organisms that we can think of as living forever. Okay, so for example, plants. Plants can be propagated, 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 and be kept essentially forever. Um, so there are systems where it appears that, that those telomeres are rejuvenated, and again, we don't fully understand that picture. Yes? Uh, wouldn't toxins build up in those cancer cells and eventually kill them off? Why would they build up in a cancer cell any more than any other cell? Exactly. I'm sorry? No, because I mean they're, they're just a cell that's dividing like any other cell, so there's no reason that they would build up any more than any, they would in any other cell. So I'd say no, no. Okay, so I told you we'd find that interesting. Uh, I usually get more questions on telomerase than any other thing I talk about in the class. All right, uh, let's see, what else? There's more of the blah, 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 and more blah, blah, blah. Okay. Okay. And there's a bunch of polymerases. There are a bunch of polymerases uh, in eukaryotes. It, I, again, I don't think it really matters that we go through. The functions of all the eukaryotic polymerases is not completely clear. And there's probably about 10 to 12. There's a lot of, of DNA polymerases in um, eukaryotic cells. OK, that's what I want to say about DNA uh, replication. Um, I'd like to, if there are no questions, turn our attention to RNA uh, synthesis. Any questions before I move forward? Okay, RNA. So RNA um, turns out to be simpler in some ways than DNA replication and more complicated in other ways. So the simpler thing is that we see, um, first of all, that RNA synthesis is slower than DNA synthesis. So if we look at E. coli, for example, where we had about 1,000 base pairs per second, we see that RNA is synthesized at the rate of about 50 base pairs per second. Very big difference. So RNA synthesis is not optimized like DNA synthesis is. The, replicate, the, the forks where, excuse me, where we make RNA are different than those of DNA because we're typically only copying one strand of the duplex, not both. Okay. So in DNA replication, we had to copy both. That polymerase had to be at the fork and had to look both directions to do what it was doing. In RNA synthesis, the polymerase only has to be on one strand and copy that one strand. Another thing that's different about RNA synthesis is RNA is made in relatively short segments. In DNA synthesis, we're making the whole chromosome. In RNA, we're only copying individual genes. In prokaryotes, we'll see that the copying can involve uh, several links.